Uh, yes, uh, two years ago, um, Sharon, I, uh, I saw a void um, of leadership in our community, a great need of someone to help uh, bring ideas to the surface and to play those ideas out. And in conversations with uh, current council members at the time, it appeared that uh, the largest hang-up, as they shared with me, was the current administration. And so I remember asking, it was about two years ago exactly, asking that council member, uh, who's going to run for mayor next time around then? If this is so important, who's going to do it? And so then um, when she didn't have an answer, I thought I'd better start considering if it might need to be me in two years' time. And that's Yes, ma'am. All right, so you were in half of your half of your term, basically. All right. So you feel the void. I'm sorry. What was the void? Like, what did you? As it was uh, as it was explained to me at the time was um, uh, there was a lack of ideas of how to come up with solutions uh, and inability to come up with solutions for the problems that we faced. And so um, they attributed a lot of it to animosity from the administration, not allowing ideas to percolate or even come forward for fear of reprisal, or just being you know, treated poorly for having an idea someone didn't like. And that was squashing debate and creativity. Um, those were some of the things that were described to me at the time. And I felt that with the, the right leadership, um, with the, the right initiative, that we could begin to change those things. Um, I've been in Maple Heights almost 19 years. I have three children, two adult sons, uh, a daughter who is a senior who will be graduating in 2016 at the high school. I have two grand, uh, four grandchildren, two who are at the elementary school. Uh, my husband and I recently purchased a business in Maple, Maple Heights. So I'm a local business owner. It had been in an American Veterans Hall that we uh, purchased about a year ago. And it was a private club. Maple Heights does not have a community center. We wanted to open it up so that people could have small events. And that, that's a challenge. We don't have a, that kind of facility in Maple Heights. I mean, we were not blessed with a recreation center. So to sum it up for me, uh, being in Maple Heights, um, and I chose it twice, um, we lived on, there's two sides to Maple Heights, an east side and a west side. We lived on an east side in a bungalow, and we're a blended family. Oh, and I met my current husband, he was raising his nephew, and I it was a mother of two. And so all of a sudden that bungalow became very small, and we chose a bigger house, which it happens to be uh, on, on the west side. So I chose it twice, and then with the business um, investment, my son was living in another community. My, my younger son, he's moved back. So the people that I love and care about the most live in Maple Heights. I am very invested in Maple Heights being a homeowner, having children, uh, uh, a child still in the school system, grandchildren now, and a first grader and a fifth grader, and being a business owner. And um, the fiscal crisis that we're in, I may be speaking a little bit out of turn, but there, things were, were just going in a way that was not good for a person looking for a return on her investment. For most people, your biggest investment is your home. Uh, and I was looking for a return on my investment in terms of my business, in terms of my home, in terms of quality of life for my children. And um, I chose, I said, you know what? Why should someone else do it? I'm step up because things are not going well for our city. And for that reason, for those people that I love, for those things that I love, my home, my business, my residents, my customers, because they're my customers now, I'm running for Mayor of Maple Heights. Okay, and talk about that fiscal emergency that the auditor declared um, this spring. So what would you, as mayor, um, what's your role? Well, um, I was able to have a phone conversation with one of the uh, members of the Fiscal uh, Commission to kind of get an idea. And we have five years to, to, to get this thing right, to get out of, out of this emergency. You know, it's embarrassing as a community when you say it in your Maple Heights, they say, oh, you're like another community, you're in fiscal emergency. So one of the goals for me is um, professionally I'm a property tax professional, a commercial property tax professional working with the local Board of Revisions and I work in 88 counties. So I understand valuation in a very uh, a professional way and a significant way, having done that for 15 years. We have a couple of initiatives we've got to get done right away. And that is we've got to get our values up and we have to start selling some houses because for residential the valuation process is comparable sales. We need to get economic development um, because our biggest resource for cities is, is property taxes. And when your valuation is going down 30, 40 percent, uh, the first part of the triangle in 2012, and then just in 2015, another 8 percent, your property tax uh, basis is declining. 
we don't have a lot of new industry. And when you don't have an economic development director that can bring businesses to the city and not only bring it but close the deal using tax and abatement incentives, it puts us at a disadvantage. So for me, it would be really getting a focus group of realtors and working with some realtors to t find out how do, you, how do you help us sell properties in Maple Heights in this difficult time when we, we have the kind of public relations that we have. And we need, it's, it's a critical position. We've got a critical position. We have to have an economic development director. Now, uh, is that position fill, uh, not filled just because it's not filled, or is it, do you simply not budget for an economic development director? It's not filled because we don't have money. When we, my husband and I purchased our building, I was working with a young lady, uh, and it was a very difficult process personally for us because she was leaving. She is in another community. Be given the fiscal crisis, that position was not filled, as many aren't okay. because of the situation that we're in. Now, and you mentioned that Maple Heights is major source of revenue of property taxes. I, that surprises me. So it's not income taxes. It's a bedroom community. It's been property. It's been a mix of property taxes and income tax. But being a bedroom community, it's really the the small retail that we have, and that's why Southgate was so significant in Maple Heights for a long time, which you know are, are synonymous of a bedroom community. And of course, the homeowners. That burden falls on homeowners in bedroom communities. And I'm sorry, um, I haven't passed by Southgate in a long time. How is that strip mall doing these days? It has a new owner as of two years ago, and they're building. They they are le their leasing is up. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they still are eligible for reduction. They filed you know, tax complaints because of the, the vacancy, but it's it's coming back. I think the new owner has been very responsible and has done a good job of marketing that particular shopping center. Okay, Bill. Um, yes, ma'am. You as mayor considering the fiscal crisis that community faces. Well, uh, that's a very important question, Sharon. Uh, it's a question that everybody's asking, and it's a question that needs to be answered. What are we going to do with the challenges that face our particular community? Uh, Maple Heights is not just facing uh, a deficit of, in the finances. It's not just a deficit in the finances. It's a deficit of uh, hope and believing that this community can actually be successful. Uh, just um, earlier in the month, about 10 days ago, I did another telephone survey of registered voters in the city, and a majority of people are seriously considering moving out of Maple Heights. Those are folks who have lived here uh, predominantly for more than uh, 20 years or more, yet they're considering moving out of the city because of the direction. As I'm going door to door, I'm seeing that. People are saying, I don't know. This place is not what it once was. It's not what it was when I moved here. I'm not sure I want to be here anymore. And so we're not merely facing a financial crisis. We're facing a uh, social crisis of you know, believing in our own community, the place where we live. People don't do that anymore. Largely, um, a big impact upon that loss of hope is the city government and its attitude toward the residents. It has become... Um, an entity unto itself, largely. And the attitude is such that they have all the answers, the city government does, and if the residents would just get on board with what the city government officials think needs to be done, then we'll fix this problem. But that, that's not the way things work in the community. That's not leadership. That's trying to command people. And so... Maybe we could come back to that because mm -hmm. that's a really important issue, but I wonder if you could specifically address what you would do about the city's fiscal crisis, which is an issue of finances, revenue, spending? Well, they aren't necessarily separate, and here's, and here's a, a key reason why. Um, there's been a lot of business disinvestment. Uh, there's been a lot of property disinvestment for those reasons. Those things have direct financial impacts. Um, just on the way here, I was talking with another applicant to our Planning and Zoning Commission who has had a really hard go of it because they were told one thing by City Hall, and then when they came to the planning and zoning for their variance, they were told something completely different. They've made an investment in this property that they can no longer capitalize on because they were giving bad, given bad information by city officials, and sometimes city officials who don't even care that they're giving bad information and won't own up to the fact that they're giving bad information. That is a message that's coming across to investors, to business owners, and they're saying Maple Heights isn't a safe place to go in as a business owner because I don't know what I'm going to get myself into many times. And so people are choosing, literally are choosing, not to invest in a place where they know they could be profitable if the city government were not making it such. Yes, I would say that your committee has deeper problems than that. I, 
I'm thinking of um, it's poor, I believe, right? It's more the median than income than is about thirty-seven thousand right, dollars so a year. I imagine that's dropped over the years. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's that, and, and in terms of, I'm not even sure where businesses could go there. It's mostly, you know, it seems to me when I think by residential. So is there an area there that you guys think is could be open for development, or how would you go about doing that? Absolutely. The, ask okay. That now. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is. Um, off of Lee South, um, there is an area, um, there is quite a bit of area in that area. As well as off 141st, there's an industrial area. There, are some, there is some vacant land, and we're in the process through a demolition grant through one of our uh, council persons. She uh, was very successful in getting some, um, some demolition grants and some, some houses uh, torn down. I disagree with Bill on terms of businesses not wanting to come to Maple Heights. Um, I am not mayor. I'm simply a candidate. I hope to be mayor, but already I've had many, many phone calls of people very interested in doing business in Maple Heights. They want two things, and this is the lack of the economic development director. As a property tax professional, I understand that there are incentives that we must give or abatements, and so they really want to, uh, they want to be made aware, made, I should say, they want to make sure those abatements are going to be a grant to them and someone knows how to execute them. That's been our challenge. Because of our location, our affordability, our easy access uh, to highway, it's, um, it's a relatively easy place to get out of. It's, it, it, you know, people do frequent Maple Heights. We kind of sit in the middle of things. They're interested in coming to Maple Heights. I've had a different response. And people have actually called and said, if you're mayor, I mean, this is a hypothetical question, will you... Um, Will you honor tax abatements? There was a deal on the table, and I, I, I won't share that because that, that I, I'm not in a position to do that, where all they wanted was a reduction in income tax. I, I will agree with him that we've not had the most cooperation at City Hall. So there, the interest is in, look, in someone new coming in mayor and, and willing to understand how business is done. What we've not, we're, we're, there's a lack of understanding how business is done. There's a give and take, and that, that expertise hasn't been there. I don't think it's just with the void of the economic development director in over a year. I think it's 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 at a, at a top level, and I'm not naming anyone. And so, but there are investors that are very interested in coming to Maple Heights, and, and I can I can tell you that that it, that is for certain. They just want to make sure that, like other cities do, um, very successfully, that have an economic development director and that have business uh, quarters and industrial parks, that we understand the abatements and they're going to be privy to those just as they would for anyone else. They want us to buy for their business. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that been my experience. Okay. Bill, about economic in your city, economic mm -hmm. development and where that could happen? Uh, I can tell you a, a brief story that happened in the past year. It was about a year ago. Um, the city was courting while they had an economic development director. Um, a uh, investment firm that uh, primarily did um, senior living. Uh, they made uh, senior living units. They have one in a neighboring community. They were considering Maple Heights. And it seemed like it would be a good fit, a good place to do one. Now, they were given a proposed piece of property, which was on the southeast side or southwest side of the city. And um, we're told what the size of it was, that this would be a great location, whatever. Um, in conversations I had then with the investor, I said, have you ever looked at the property? Because when I went by, it's nothing but a ravine. It's literally a ravine about 100 feet deep, this property. And he said, oh, that's the property the economic development director gave us. And, you know, they it, it said, it's fine, it's great. And I said, well, I would go look at it if I were you. They backed out. After months of planning, processing, courting, they backed out. Not because of tax abatements, they were going to get those. Not because of this Maple Heights not being the right community, but because the city completely dropped the ball in offering a property that was not developable for this purpose. So I, that obviously is, leaves a bad taste in someone's mouth. And I could tell you many other stories of investors who have similar um, type scenarios where a bad taste has been left in their mouth by city government. And even, uh, I remember talking with one gentleman who, uh, who owns properties, rents them. I said, what would you like to see in this city? I mean, is it, is it too expensive, you know, with the city's fees that they might charge? He said, no. He said, I would pay more if I could just know that city government would let me run my business. It would not be so intrusive or unreliable. 
And so it's not necessarily a money issue, I don't think. Do you also agree with Ms. Lackpole, though, that um, the access or lack of an economic development director has been an impediment? Um, what I will say is that those problems, the problems we were facing uh, existed while we had an economic development director. So I definitely think it's an important position, but simply to say we filled it um, and therefore we'll be good and we've solved our problem uh, would not be true. Um, I understand that, that you and the um, outgoing mayor have not uh, had cordial relations. Uh, and it sounds like you had differences with many members of his administration. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is an impediment taking office that you're sort of focused on, you know, a feud, if you will, and maybe that's an overly strong word, but um, that, that that's kind of framing your, your reference point? What's framing my reference point? The um, disagreements you have with, with the outgoing mayor and his administration. And the, the lawsuits. Oh. Is, yes. Were, yes. Oh, I don't think that I am framing it in that okay. mind. Um, no, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, things are going to be pretty much brand new come January 1st. We're going to have a new administration or head of the administration. We're going to have over half of the members of council will be new. There'll be a large changeover. This to me is an opportunity in Maple Heights to change some of the institutional uh, organizational culture problems that we have within city government. And I think many people are open to that. Okay. Uh, can either of you explain why the city owes $126,000 My understanding in talking with the finance director is that the payment was made late. Um, and I don't know if this is true, but she credits it to human error. That it was made late, and before she could correct it, this article was, was made and there was some vendetta af uh, after her because people were trying to shed Maple Heights in a bad light. I don't know that to be sure, true because this is simply hearsay. But I, I do want to go back to one thing that Mr. Brownlee said about this developer because I think I know this developer. It happens to be a client that I work with. Um, the one who wanted to put in the senior house. Yeah, I, I work with this client um, and have worked with them for five years. I, I can't think of any, any company of that size that wouldn't do a site analysis. So Mr. Brownlee wouldn't have had to call him and tell him there was a ravine. They don't build this particular company that, that, that I know of without doing a site analysis. They have a team of engineers going out and making sure that, that this, this is being built on solid ground. So I, I don't know all the particulars, but I, I just find that if it's a developer that I think of, and I, I know them very well, they do a lot of senior housing, um, it would be uh, poor business for them to not do a site analysis, and the deal would simply be pulled based on them him telling them there was a ravine. They, they would know that. Although the, maybe the wider lens way of looking at this is his contention that they were offered a piece of property that was inappropriate to right. their use and that that was the reason that the deal fell through. I, I think they would have known that before they even put the deal together. So Th just knowing, okay. I don't know it because, and I, so I won't dispute it, I just find it, if it's the client that I know, and I've worked with them for five years, um, and it's similar to other clients I've worked with, before they even put a deal together like that, they've kind of, they yeah. know it, it's bad. They know that are people are trying to, we're a city, we're trying to sell, open a business, so they're going to do their due diligence. I mean, we do pre-act analysis at the firm that I work with. We do due diligence, and those kind of things are done. Do you agree with Mr. Bennett's analysis, though, that there is sort of an institutional cultural problem within city government at Maple Heights that needs a sort of airing out and a change? I think that we've come to that place, and uh, no disrespect to him, he's a part of that problem. It's been distracting. It's been, um, uh, as I have been can uh, canvassing too, I can't spend as much time as I'd like to answering the questions because I'm always having to speak to what's going on City Hall with, with the lawsuit and, 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 and the current mayor. So it's been an uh, unfortunate distraction and it's gone on a little long. Uh, while I, I, I've gotten to know him personally, as a resident and as an investor, it's been a huge distraction. Public relations. I mean, when companies come to, to businesses, they're, I mean, to, to cities, they're looking for abatements and incentives, they're looking for affordability, they're looking at the medium income, looking at all of those demographics before, you know, what's, is there disposable income, what's the racial ethnicity, what's the amount of education, we know all of these things. But they're also looking at what, what's the climate like, what's the public relations? If I open a business in Maple Heights, people are going to say, are you crazy? 
So the public relations has been very, very marred by this this issue with Mr. Brownlee and the mayor. There's another way of looking at that, though, because um, I see from your um, data sheet that you haven't held public, public office before. No. So I'm just wondering if maybe as, as an outsider you see a, a sort of a, a simple situation to turn fractiousness to amity, but that once you get in office, you would be buffeted by the same political uh, you know, issues that he confesses as member of council. Um, I don't think so. I've not held public office, but for four years I've worked in the school system uh, as a parent academy coordinator. It is a, I also chaired the 2012 school renewal levy for the city schools. Um, and I was on the charter review. So while I've not heard, held public office, I've been very, very civically involved. This will be my fifth year running the Parent Academy program, which is a national parent organization, the Center for Improvement of Child Care and Centers, uh, by the Jewish doctor, PhD, Dr. Kirby Alvey. It's a national program out of California. And so I have upfront um, relationships with a lot of these parents which uh, I get involved in a lot of things trying to resolve issues for them. I don't think I look at it with a novice idea, but I've been on the other side where I see parties come together and resolve issues. It's one of the things I really work with the parents when they're trying to resolve issues with their educators and get the education for their children. It's been very conciliatory, and I believe there's, and, and, and so perhaps from a political point, I don't see it that way. I do know that resolution is possible because I've ch achieved it on so many occasions for so many parents, just trying to navigate through the school system in my role now, going in the fifth year in the school system. So not in a political way, but I think it's a transferable skill. I think those skills are the skills that I have to, to resolve that issue, the same skills I can take to bring some harmony. I'm not saying fix it, but bring some harmony and a different approach to the issues that may exist in City Hall after the new administration takes over. But as he said, we're going to have half of the council brand new. Mr. Brownlee, this is a, a nonpartisan list, but I see that you're a member of the Republican Party Central Committee. Uh, is that what RPCC means? Uh, I was previously, yes. Well, I'm actually a registered Democrat because the way it works in Ohio, when you if you vote in a uh, party primary, yeah. So, um, no, I, I'm a, I'm an independent. Um, I most closely align with independent organizations um, because I don't think that uh, boxes necessarily fix everything. And uh, if you want to find, we've seen a lot of solutions not be come to because uh, we like boxes, and sometimes solutions exist outside of those boxes. That's that's kind of how I feel about things. Mm -hmm. Well, Betsy raises a good question, though, about mm -hmm. the, the whole lawsuit situation. I'm just kind of wondering, like, what your temperament would be if you let this community, I mean, you know, you can't always file lawsuits against city council members who tick you off or who may say things that you feel defame you. So, you know, how are you going to handle those kind of challenges? Um, well, these lawsuits are not motivated from uh, being ticked off. Uh, that's, that's not why they were filed. Um, the first lawsuit that was filed was uh, Mr. Lansky suing, uh, technically my wife, for writing an article on a community news website. Did but you guys own a newspaper? Well, it's, uh, it's a website, yeah. It's a community news website, Maple Heights News. So when she published an article that he didn't appreciate, uh, he first threatened us um, on the phone and then with a letter and then he, uh, he threatened a lawsuit, and then he sued us a few months later. Um, and uh, that, that will be resolved soon, and, and we'll see how that plays out. It's something that he's been known for, is to sue political opponents. Uh, in January, I filed a, a federal lawsuit for um, actions that were taken by city officials um, over the past year that were unlawful. Uh, one of which was was illegally uh, or unlawfully releasing my income tax, confidential income tax records in a public meeting, which is about as illegal as you can get in public office. Uh, and then I was uh, illegally removed from a council meeting before voting began, so I couldn't even vote on legislation by uh, the president of council. And then uh, I record the council meetings. Then the video camera was removed. Uh, these were unlawful uh, acts taken by the um, sit various city officials. This didn't have anything to do with being upset about something. If it would have been, then those would have been filed, I think, a lot sooner than that. Uh, so I waited a long time to do these things because I didn't want to do them. 
but when uh, you realize that you're, you're out of options for making the changes that need to happen, then uh, you have to move on to the next option that you have, and that was the only one remaining. Okay. And what do you do when there are some people who are still loyal to the mayor who are on council and you know, might still you know, maybe carry some vendettas or something against you for some of the actions that you took? Well, you just do the best you can. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, information is important. Uh, lots of times you have, you know, emotions play into things, but if, if you're steady, uh, if you're persistent, and you have good information, a lot of times you can succeed in making your point. If I could interject, Bill, you published City Employee Social Security Number on your website, and when I got to council that evening, it was mayhem there. It is, 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 uh, so I understand you know, the lawsuits going back and forth as much as I can being on the outside. But you yourself published city employees' social security numbers. And there was an action to, there was some in investigation into bringing charges against you and your wife. So I, I just find that you all, you went all the way to fall in a lawsuit, but you then did the same thing to these innocent people that had no right to have their, their, their social security numbers published. Bill? So I, I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. Bill, how do you explain that? Uh, well, what happened, um, it, it's not quite, the way she's portrayed it is, is not... Um, and I apologize if I don't have the facts correct. Not quite correct. Uh, what happened was uh, my wife published a list that we received as part of a public records request uh, with the Social Security numbers redacted. So they're redacted with a, uh, a black magic marker. And what ended up happening was that there was one secu Social Security number out of like, I don't know, 400 that a few of the digits could be seen. Not all the digits, a few of the digits could be seen. And uh, when that was brought to our attention, it was in a PDF uh, document, so it was a scan of a, of a redacted document. Um, when that was brought to our attention, we pulled it down, uh, did an approved redaction of the uh, Social Security numbers, and then put it back up with the improvement. So that's what happened. And the, in the investigation um, was not actually into my wife and I's actions. It was actually into the law department's actions in, reduce, in uh, releasing um, Social Security numbers that were not fully redacted. And that has been uh, conducted as far as I know, and there hasn't been any action taken beyond that. And I'm sorry, I just have a brief question about mm -hmm. this whole Ohio Water Development Authority thing. Why would Maple owe um, money to that authority? Is that what you guys do for water, or, or what's going on there? These are, uh, these are loans um, for improvements uh, that to the, to the city of Maple Heights. So these are loan payments. Mm -hmm. um, the payments that were missed uh, back at the beginning of the year, some of them, if not all of them, were to the uh, OWDA, I believe it was, the Ohio Water Development Authority, I believe is what it is. Um, and those were not paid because there simply wasn't money in the bank to pay them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the simple truth of it. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what were you trying to improve in Maple Heights? I'm not sure. That's, that's, uh, those are loans. I'm not sure what time they're from. Okay, yeah, that's the part yeah. I didn't get. Mm -hmm. like, Water, mm -hmm. I there's a there's continuing uh, expenditures along those lines, so there are, there are kind of running lines of credit with uh, various organizations that uh, offer low interest or no interest loans oh. to the city to make improvements. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, yeah, that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes, it wasn't paid because there was there was literally no cash in the bank in January, and this story about it being human error is is really a fabrication, which is a, which is an outworking of why things are bad in Maple Heights because we can't get honest information from the people we need that honest information from. So um, that this has been a year long process of ending up in fiscal emergency. It started with fiscal caution, which was declared back in 2014 in April. Um, so this was not a surprise to anyone. That's the story that some people have chose to tell. It was not a surprise. It's been a long process in which city officials have been meeting with officials from the uh, auditor, state auditor's office, for months upon months to figure these things out. So um, the reason that was not paid is, is, is simply because we didn't have the money to pay it at that time. I will say this, you, you mentioned that I have not been on city council, and you're correct. Bill Brownlee has been on city council for two years. So I, he often refers to the council 
as if he has, is not a part of it or hasn't been on it. Uh, I am not aware of any initiatives he's brought forth to address these issues. I, I'm, I'm not aware. And so, but he speaks as if this is a different entity and he's somehow not a part of this governing body and he has been for two years. Um, have you put anything on the table to try to solve this issue or how have you? Uh, well, yes, I can think of one thing off the top of my head, which was uh, earlier in the year, I introduced a resolution uh, to reduce the salaries of elected officials in Maple Heights which would have realized a savings of at least $37,000. And it was uh, not only voted down, it, it was met with downright animosity from uh, the rest of the administration and council. And um, it was, I thought it was a very straightforward. Um, it would have saved $37,000 a year. So um, currently, uh, city members, or city council members receive a part-time salary of $12,000 a year. And I, I propose reducing it to 9000 which is comparable to other communities uh, in Cuyahoga County for a part-time city council person. I uh, also suggested re reducing the mayor's salary from 85000 down to 75000 uh, This, uh, all told, would have seen a savings of about $37,000 if my memory serves me. Well, that's, that's an amount that would get us on the way to uh, hiring someone else that we might need, like an economic development director, or maybe even more importantly, uh, more building, inspecting, uh, building inspection officials in the city of Maple Heights. $37,000, uh, I don't see that as a drop in a bucket. <laughs> We've been talking about East Cleveland and about their fiscal emergency and you know urging them to to merge with mm -hmm. Cleveland. Annex, yeah. uh, why should Maple Heights, which is really struggling now and basically existing off of you know some small property tax and income tax? I, I have a big story here about how you know you guys got hit during the recession really yes, hard and have had a hard time coming out of that, even though some areas of the of our region is doing better. So mm -hmm. why should you exist at all? Why not merge with a nearby community? I would not say that that might not be the end result at some point many years down the road. I don't think that time is now. I think you've got some committed people. We had five people in the race initially running for mayor. You have two sitting in front of you now that really, really care about Maple Heights, that bring a different skill set. Uh, skills different but some different skill set that have a com compassion and a commitment to the people in Maple Heights that really want to reclaim their city. Um, I've met people that have been there since 1950 and I'm very realistic and they are too. It's not going to be back the way it was but they still believe and they still have the fight in them to try to bring it back. We've got some things that are very obvious that we're not doing. One of the things is we have a, almost a five million dollar uncollected property tax. We're, we're just that delinquent in property taxes. We okay, about hold on, but usually that happens because, you know, some people just can't pay. They some can't. people have walked away, walked and away. the bank is there, and the, and the bank is there. Right. Like, I'm not taking the We have some, so we have some of those issues. We can, there are some people that are, we have a lot of investors that, um, own many, many properties in Maple Heights, and so these are people that we can find that do have the ability to pay. I'm not talking about the homeowner that's just walked away because he or she's underwater, but the investors that come in, and there are some legislation that they can get an occupancy percent permit if the property taxes are delinquent. But we have people that are working or are not paying income taxes, uncollectible. We've done nothing to collect those taxes. We do have to reach beyond the city of Maple Heights. Our help is beyond the city of Maple Heights, not necessarily annexing another city, but there are people waiting that want to come to Maple Heights to do business in Maple Maple Heights, partner with Maple Heights, help save Maple Heights. It's like six degrees of separation. Everywhere I go, someone has a family member or a church member or a neighbor that lives in Maple Heights. Maple Heights is a very, very proud town. It had a great, stellar reputation. There are people willing to fight for that, and they've made sacrifices. There are a lot that have stayed and fought, and they have been engaged in this race because they're looking for an answer. If someone is willing to come in there, roll their sleeves and get the work, they're saying, we're going to work with you. I believe that, which is why I went and bought a business, I could have bought it somewhere else, because I still believe that. But I'm not an anomaly. There are many people that believe that. We believe we're unique. We are a diverse community, and you don't hear a lot of issues. We've got five brand new schools that are struggling to try to do the right thing. People are still moving there, hoping there's a better life. There's some great homes in Maple Heights. They're affordable. They're beautiful. They're all different. We have such a mix, an eclectic mix of homes in Maple Heights. We're right by Tinker's Creek. There's so many great things in Maple Heights. 
and we just don't want to give up. And I'm one of those people. Just don't want to give up. Why should your city exist? Why not merge? <laughs> uh, well, practically speaking, that's, that's a political impossibility at this point in time. You don't just wake up one day and say, hey, we're going to merge with somebody, and you do it in the, in no, the fo coming year. In um, about East Cleveland, uh, in talking with uh, their mayor, he, he's they're in a very desperate situation in East I'm Cleveland. Sorry, why did you talk to Gary Norton? Gary oh, just to, to find out, you know, kind of what's going on, to, to chat with him. And uh, while we were chatting, he he shared that he recognizes, you know, that there were changes that could have been made earlier on. Yet he didn't want to make them because no one wants to be that guy. No one wants to be that guy who maybe shuts the senior center down, reduces security forces in some way. Yet, sometimes when you get down to it, those are the decisions that need to be made, though they are difficult, in order to save this, the entire situation, the entire community. So um, when you're in a tight situation like Maple Heights is, you have to do some very serious thinking about your priorities, your priorities for the whole community, not just even for those who vote but for the whole community. And so um, that's where Maple Heights is. And as of right now, um, those discussions would be way on the back burner um, because, well, honestly, they're on the back burner for everyone else. They're on the front burner for people. And it's not something that you would wake up one day and merge a city, I don't think. What you would do is you begin to move, merge services first and you begin to cooperate in other ways, and then the actual governance of the community, you might consider combining those things. You wouldn't go straight for the top, unless you end up in a situation like East Cleveland, where there's really no other option possibly for that community. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question that maybe isn't an issue in the mayor's race, but has been on my mind uh, for a while. You know, in the context of police reform um, in Cleveland, this is an issue that is definitely on the front burner. A while back, uh, after Ferguson, uh, we looked at some of the composition of area police forces, and I, I think actually other news organizations have been the same, and they highlighted uh, Maple Heights, uh, that not having diversity on the police force, even though it is a diverse community, uh, versus Cleveland Heights, which uh, which does, and we did an editorial about that, um, looking at some of what Cleveland Heights was doing to recruit minority police officers. Is this an issue uh, for uh, you as a candidate for mayor, something that you think can be addressed? It is certainly an issue for me as a mother of two adult African-American sons and grandmother of three African-American young boys. Um, with the highlight, and, and even my 10-year-old grandson, he understands what happened with Trayvon Martin and all of these horror stories. I mean, it's difficult to shield them from, from these, the, these, these truths. And so, when you talk about community policing strategies, and I've did a lot of research on them, and I've, I've, I've had several meetings with the current chief, just asking, you know, as, as I'm trying to, you know, prepare myself for being mayor, hopefully, um, or at least being a, a, a contender, I want to be prepared um, of what what that will look like, and because we got to start somewhere. How do you reach our youth? You, it's it's not it's news, and it's been news more about public relations, the, the fight that was in Maple Heights recently among the young ladies. And because I do work in the schools as the parent academy coordinator, the one thing I get from the parents is they don't trust the, the, the police. They don't want the police talking to their sons because the next thing they know, their son will be downtown somewhere and they will have a hard time reaching. They really fear that. And so to address that fear, we need to, we, it, it's imperative, it is imperative that we have our police force look somewhat like the people that it represents. We're over 70% African American now. We cannot continue to have a police force that doesn't live in Maple Heights and doesn't look like the people in Maple Heights. That is, that's a huge issue. And the mayor is also the safety officer. He or she needs to address that, begin to put programs on and make that, 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 that we can make that happen. As um, Kenneth Brownlee has done, uh, I've also been in contact with mayors, and not so much contact, but mayors are contacting, from other communities are contacting me. As, they probably have contacted him as well. Because there's a lot of interest in what's happening in Maple Heights and who's going to change things. It's been a difficult place. Our mayor has had some fights he's had with, that have spread countywide. You can't go anywhere and so, say, oh, you're from Maple. You're, you're the one with that. You're in the city with that mayor. And so to overcome that and change that and say that there's a new sheriff in town and, and I'm reasonable and I'm willing to listen, you know, let's talk about it. And um, some of the areas he's talking about, 
have some police recruits that are not happy where they are. They're in some communities that are struggling that are possibilities. There are some charter schools that have some young men that are interested in law enforcement that we can reach out to. Um, that because it's a good living it's a good living for a, a lot of these young men of color if they don't want to college it's a vocation that they can really make a good living and so those conversations I've begun to have but not in my role as candidate of mayor it's transitioned to this role but because of my role as parent academy coordinator for the schools I have access to, mm -hmm. to, to those individuals and those organizations um, there has been um, a lot of concern about yeah the diversity of the police department um, and by that, I mean there have been some people who have expressed a lot of concern about it. Yet, um, I put this in one of my polls during the summer, my telephone polls. And of you know, the about 200 people who responded to the poll, that was not a concern of, of theirs. Uh, people were, were actually largely satisfied with the police um, in Maple Heights. The respondents of the survey expressed so. Um, and they felt they could even trust the police force because that's something I have heard as well from certain individuals. I don't know if I can trust the police, so I thought I'd put it out to the, to the public at large and see, well, is this a pervasive issue? Um, and I found that in this polling, no, it's not actually pervasive. Um, I expected it to be so, but it wasn't in the, in the polling. So I'm not quite sure that it's as big of an issue among the entire populace as uh, we might be led to believe by certain people. Um, I would be interested to see more about what Cleveland Heights has done if they've come to a more diverse um, police force. Uh, I know it's a struggle that seems to be happening nationwide where uh, there aren't as many um, African-American recruits or uh, cadets applying for uh, police work as there is a demand. Um, I've seen reports of that. And so I, I've heard the same from our police chief and our police force. But what we really struggle with at this point in time is just keeping police officers. That's the struggle that we're facing in Maple Heights. Well, um, the retention is a challenge, I'd say probably for three reasons, is um, it's difficult to be economically competitive. And so other communities, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, that could be one of the reasons. Uh, secondly is um, some of the, uh, there has been expressions of, of concern about safety within the police force. Like, it, it is a tough place to work in Maple Heights. It's not like working in Broadview Heights or somewhere else where things aren't quite as exciting, as you might say. Um, but then thirdly has been not only do we have a lack of trust and hope for the future in the community, but even in the employees that work for the city and the police force. There's wondering, where are we going? Where are we going? We've lost our ballast. Um, and people are concerned about the, the long-range um, employment opportunities that they have in Maple Heights. How's it going to look uh, a year from now, two years from now? And so they're considering other options. These are very, these, this is the even more serious issue that's facing us right now is just keeping the police officers we have. Um, we're way down below our uh, staffing levels right now because we've lost a lot of people. Yeah, what I found in um, you know, looking into this issue is it's not, as, it's not like hiring something for a secretarial position where you just look at the candidates and you, you pick one. There is an in-depth process that takes place with testing. Um, there are many bars that you have to leap over and hoops you have to leap through. And so it's not a matter of, you know, we want more of a particular type of person working here, and so therefore we just pick those people. They have to make it through all the hoops and over all the bars and then be there from the, the, the group that you actually get to choose from. So I would be interested in hearing more about what Cleveland Heights has done if they've been successful in this way, because I think that it is a challenge that faces us all. And, you know, if they have some solutions, some good ideas, I think they would be helpful. I would just like to comment. You know, that has resonated on a, on a couple places in Maple Heights. And now, he's doing a polling. You've got to remember I have a different captive audience. I've got parents that, that I'm working with. They're going to be a little bit more honest with me because they've worked with me. But th there's this belief that uh, diverse candidates can't pass the civil service exam. And um, 
I'm not saying that's what I heard, but I, I, I felt like that was what was inferred, that they, this is not a secretarial position, which is a, a very professional and a very difficult position as well. I spent many years as an executive assistant to the president and chief medical officer of University Hospitals. That is a challenge. So uh, it, uh, secretarials don't just pick up the job and go with it. You, you're, doing, you're, you're like an assistant manager. You're running the, the show sometimes. Um, but I, I just hope it's not the inference that uh, it would be difficult or almost impossible, uh, or because it's 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 not as simple as secretarial to diversify police force. I don't believe that at all. I, I just just want to make a comment on that because that keeps coming up and it's just it's it's really it upsetting to me. No, I, I, I've, people in the pe I've heard this in the community a couple of times. I've heard I, I've not heard it from Mr. Brownley before because we've not been this in this setting before, but uh, and and I just want you to know that the young men hear it too. They hear it too. When you, said, when you were describing the role of the secretary, I had to uh, smile because we had a mayor in this morning running for re-election whose secretary makes more than he does. <laughs> <laughs> Key position. <laughs> Must have those uh, higher level skills there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, a story said that the community is 60 percent black. I think I might have heard you say it was 70 percent. I yeah, I subscribe to Cleveland Magazine um, and the, you know, they do the Rate the Suburbs that came out in the June edition. It was 71.2. And I'm, so, I'm just kind of curious, yeah. uh, is there a momentum for a, the, you would be the first black, uh, first African American mayor? And first family? woman. There's and never first been a woman. woman. Okay. Never. Is there any wind in your sails from running that kind I, of I would, I, I would not be telling the truth. I said people are, are very excited about that possibility. Um, uh, and, and for a couple of reasons. A lot of people know me. I've had three kids go to the school system, and now I've got great. Everybody knows, you know, I don't want to call my kids' names, but that's so-and-so's mom, that's so-and-so's grandmother. Everyone knows me. Um, they also know me now because they're calling and say, hey, is your hall ready? I want to have a birthday party. So I'm well-known in the community. So I would say it's, it's, it's the reputation and the longevity I've had there first. And then secondly, it would be uh, the fact that I'm a woman. Uh, they think that women bring a different perspective. They're looking for something totally different, so they're looking for a totally different perspective. I happen to be a woman, and the belief is that women come from things differently than men, so because they're looking for something so different, because they they're just really are so apathetic right now. And I happen to be black. It's more I happen to be black, but it's more people know me um, and um, respect me. I have a, have a good, long reputation in history in Maple Heights for the many things I've done. And I happen to be a woman because they just they want to go that far left. When something goes this far wrong, you want to go completely opposite. So I'm completely the opposite, and I just happen to be black. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, is it time for a change? I'm sorry? Is, is it time for a change in Maple Heights in terms of leadership? Yeah, it's definitely time for a change. Um, Something that uh, I, I learned through my time coming to council meetings, talking with council members before I was on council and now having been on council for two years, is that uh, Maple Heights has been run in a particular fashion for a long time. And it doesn't have anything to do with the race or the sex of the individuals doing it. It's got everything to do with their attitude. And uh, the people of Maple Heights, the residents of Maple Heights and the business owners are the ones who have suffered because of this totalitarian kind of dictatorial rule of city officials um, and I would say somewhat callous rule of city officials over the years. Um, that's what needs to change. People are disillusioned. Um, they are constantly saying, um, I would move out if I could. And that's a very bad sign for a community. It's a very bad sign. And something needs to change very quickly very quickly, I would say in the next two years, or we'll be in very serious, very serious trouble in Maple Heights. Um, financially, uh, something needs to change in the next two years, and in the next two years, something needs to change as far as what people believe about their community, or um, we will be in a very bad place. Can I ask, um, your office is not originally from Maple Heights, your mm -hmm. data sheet says you're from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. so you're a different accent than Midwest. <laughs> Uh, four years ago, um, I was attending Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, downtown Chicago, and um, studying communications. 
I wanted to get a more hands-on training in communications, so I came out here with my family to uh, Garfield Heights at first for a few months with a, in a, an apartment so that we could get ready to attend um, the Ohio Center for Broadcasting, which is in Valley View. And then we purchased a home um, after looking for about a month in Maple Heights, a foreclosure, picked it up for $7,500, and uh, fixed it up and moved in on August 4th of 2011. So that's how we ended up where we are. Um, I was, I'm from Selma, Alabama. It's, it's ironic that that movie would come out right now. Um, I moved here in 1964 as a two-year-old. My family is a, was a family of sharecroppers. And my dad, is, as many of um, blacks in that time, came for a better life. Sharecropping was no way to, to make a living. So he came in 62 to, to, to make a way for my mom and my sister and I. And then we came up here. It's a better life. He ended up, uh, ironically, being the first black bell captain at the Bluegrass Inn in Maple Heights. It was a hotel, which is now the Lamplight Inn, and I, I grew up playing there. Never thought we'd live there, because we, we commuted from, you know, 100 St. Clair and Eddie Road, and mm -hmm. that, that was like, you know, you take your lunch, because it was a, a job. But while he was there, he uh, heard they were hiring at Ford Motor Company down the street on Northfield. So he did 32 years at the Walton Hill Stamping Plant. I just lost him um, seven months ago. Um, so we did 32 years at the uh, Walton Hill Stamping Plant. And for us, it was just about our life. We went back every summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day to help out on the farm. But there was just, it just wasn't a good life when we were, I mean, sharecropping. You just didn't, no one owned, you didn't own anything. You just worked the land. And uh, my dad didn't want that for us. So this, this is a, a much better life for my family and I. Well, um, the one question that we had was actually what we asked. We oh. asked the question in the course of uh, talking to you guys about police oh. and diversity mm -hmm. in the police force. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Bill, starting with you, uh, if you were on my porch in Maple Heights, um, tell me, why should I vote for you? Well, if I was on your porch, I would be glad to see you, because uh, not everyone's on their porch when I come by. <laughs> I'm weird. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, uh, we need more porch sitting. I think that would be healthy for our community. Uh, but I would, uh, I would tell you that, you know, I'm glad to see you and that, um, you know, Sharon, if we do the right things, we can get the outcome that we want. And we've had a few years, quite a few years, of uh, lack of leadership that has led us to where we are today. You know, it doesn't have to stay this way. Because if people are willing to make an investment, like my family and I have been, not just financially, but culturally, then we can make it a better place to live. If we can take ownership of this place and push back the darkness, then we will be able to say Maple Heights is better in four years from now. My family and I have taken the initiative to start um, you know, mowing the grass, raking the leaves, picking up the sticks at the community kitty park just down the street from us, because the city stopped taking care of it. And it was becoming um, an embarrassment and a drag on our community. It doesn't build pride when something like that is falling into deterioration. So we've been doing that this summer because that's the type of investment we need. We need people to believe that this can be better. Because if you start letting it go like that, it's just a downhill slope to a place that we don't want to be. But if we decide that we're going to make an investment, that we're going to take a stand here and make a difference, then we can change this place. And I truly believe that. Am I coming on your porch? Yes. You I hope you have some Come sweet. I hope you have some sweet tea. But if you don't have any sweet tea, that's okay. I'll just take my water. Very. Oh yeah. Um, well, the first thing I would in introduce myself and tell you that I am innovative, invested, and involved. I think outside of the box. I'm invested. I've worked with parents. I've worked with the city and the Charter Review. I chaired the 2012 school levy, working with school officials and educators. I'm very involved. Um, in terms of um, oh, in terms of now having the business, and, and going to the things, uh, uh, my daughter is, is is in the National Honor Society, and I'm always there. Someone calls me, I, I'm always there in terms of, of helping them, being a mentor. I write so many resumes, and I try to mentor to a lot of children. But and I tell you that I I am committed to bringing a best and a best and brightest administration in Maple Heights, um, in terms of just looking for the best talent we have, even if it's part time. So we may not be able to pay for a very, very uh, savvy economic development, but we can certainly pay for a part-time. I believe in collaboration, regionalization, and just maybe asking if we could have an economic development for four hours a week 
a city that's thriving. I tell you that I do believe in better citizen representation. We do have some issues in Maple Heights and getting the word out and a better perception, people feeling welcome and not feeling so apathetic. I tell you that I'm very committed to an aggressive economic recovery through collaboration, regionalization, reaching across uh, just the, the Cuyahoga County all the way to the state if I have to and offering those incentives. I tell you that we're going we're, we're gonna to have a positive public relation program. The things that I love and know about Maple Heights and that my neighbors would agree to, let's get together and let's put it on film and let's, let's share that. We don't hear the good, the good things. I was in a meeting yesterday and we hear about the fiscal recovery, but how many people know that we just over a five-year period, we have $14 million in grants that we received. And the last thing I tell you that I, I know that I need to focus on quality of life consciousness, specifically in the areas of safety, seniors, and youth. Our citizen, senior citizen may close. How are we going to address that if it does close? What are the plans if it does close? And we, our pool's closed for our youth. They can't swim. The basketball hoops are out. He mentioned the park is, are, is in disrepair. I tell you, that those are the five things I'm most, most uh, focused on. That I'm your next mayor. That's going to be my job every day. These five points are going to be, and I'm going to work every day to address every last one of them. That's what I would say.